Good morning, Monterey Church. I discovered what the difference is between being really early and arriving just on time. Being taken for granted and being a blessing. If you arrive really early, it's, How's, here's Doug. If you arrive just on time, it's, thank you, Lord, Doug's arrived. <laughs> He's a blessing. <laughs> Gray hairs I might have given anybody there. Actually, I just quickly Googled my own name. And uh, Douglas means dark, um, black waters or dark stream. Yeah, that's got no uh, other connotations to it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, not the easiest guy to fathom. Um, but it's just good to be here today, truly. Um, I was thinking of Ed yesterday, who was the previous uh, regional pastor for Northland, and uh, I stepped into the long shadow of uh, Ed's big feet, that he, the, the, big, the large shadow he left here. And you know, just thinking of Ed, what a, what a great man. You know, a real warrior for God. And I think for me, Ed's greatest uh, attribute was his humility. You know, he was just such a humble man and such a, a man who, who loved, loved the Lord. Lord. Um, and, and, you know, you know just, just, yeah, yeah. It, as I say, it sets, sets a great example. It's great to be here, and uh, good to see some old faces. The hair's going a bit grey there, George, but then so is mine. <laughs> great to be here, and uh, Adrian. I kind of stayed with the original theme of uh, spiritual gifts as a theme for today, but I want to take it into, uh, into a, different, uh, a slightly different context. But our text for today, I will take from Romans chapter 1 and verses 11 and 12. And Paul's writing to the Romans and he says, I long to see you that I may impart to you, or um, the, the actual translation is strengthen you with some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Um, this is the first time in the Bible, in the New Testament, that the word spiritual gifts, that term actually um, is, is found. And as we look at spiritual gifts today, um, and, and as I think back, spiritual gifts are, it, it is the way the church functions the body of Christ is put together. And, you know, Corinthians tells us, Paul says there, that there's an arm and a leg and, and everybody functions in the context of the gifting of God in their lives. And I'm a firm believer in that 100% to the point that I don't think there should be any other way by which church runs, church functions. Your church needs to be organized around the gifting of the Holy Spirit because it's not a human endeavor, is it? The Holy Spirit, is, it's Christ's church and his gifts that he gives to each one of us and gives to you. And as you sit here and as I am here today, we all have that gifting. But I want to put that gifting into context. And, um, and I'm not going to be... And actually, my, my, my thought process around this gifting has changed over time. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll share that with you today. So coming to um, just kind of the, 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 the space that God has kind of come into my life this year has been one where I've suddenly realized, and it was in all the songs that we've just been singing, is the supreme place that God wants to have in our lives. Not just wants to have, that he deserves to have. Because he's the sovereign God. He's the God of glory. He was before there was nothing. Before there was a star in the sky or a planet or a universe, there was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And we know that Christ was the creative force in that great creation. But before, in the beginning, in, before there was anything, there was God. And it is this God who we have the privilege of actually walking in relationship with. That is mind-blowing. 
You know, and, and it, it, it takes us, at, it's, as I say, it, it takes us right out of our, hum, uh, our human zone into this, you know, in, into this zone of just the most, the hugest privilege. And so as we function in whatever capacity, we need to be, it's not a state of doing, it's a state of being. You know, man, uh, the Pharisees came to Jesus to try and trip him up. And uh, in Matthew 22, one says, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which commandment is the greatest in the law? Which is the greatest commandment? And if I would ask you that today, what would your response be? Even knowing what Jesus has, what Jesus' reply was. What is it? And as they looked at that, and, and I, I believe that comes back down to the human condition, where, which is, one, it, it always becomes about us. It always becomes about me, and, and it becomes, my, my world is egocentric, and it revolves around pleasing me and making me happy, and, and everything fitting into my way of doing and seeing and thinking and being. But Jesus replied, Jesus didn't reply. I love the way the Bible says, Jesus declared, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That's a state of being, not a state of doing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And that second great commandment of love, the, and, and love the, your neighbor as yourself is where spiritual gifts comes into play. This is the domain of spiritual gifts. For the one who loves the Lord their God with all their heart. By the way, the, if you want to, the, 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 the greatest, sweetest walk you will ever have is one where God has supreme place in your life. Where every day you wake up, every day is a joy and a delight in God to know that I have a, a, a relationship with God. Everything falls into place. But if you take your eyes off God, your eyes will inadvertently just revert back to the mirror of self. So... But having the Lord your God with that passion and then finding that in that walk, in that joy in God, in that delight in God, the expression of your life in the context of that relationship. It's a state of being, not a state of doing. And that's what Jesus was saying to them. Which is the greatest commandment? Hey, all the commandments are great if you walk in the joy of the Lord. And um, that's not detracting from a single state, from, from, a, from a, a single commandment. Um, not one jot nor one tittle will, should be taken away. But the point is. And then so everything in, our, everything in our walk needs to come back to that. It needs to be grounded in God's glory. I've been on a journey just looking, my preaching this year has been in the context of the prayers in the Bible. And they, when you go deep into these prayers, they're amazing. And the supreme prayer in the Bible is which one? Our Father. Because that's the one Jesus taught. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. You get the sense? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your being. My Father in heaven, holy is your name. Not just hallowed, okay. reverence you. You, you. You're amazing, God. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. It's putting God on the primary place that he belongs. On the pedestal at the center of the universe. And when we do that, then the other aspect of loving your neighbor comes into play. And um, so it, it's fueled by faith. This faith that is in our sense, in our walk, in the reality of God. You know Him, you have Him. That's faith. It's experienced in joy. It's expressed in awe and, and, and awareness of some form. The presence of God is there for everybody. It's always interesting when people 
having a, a near-death experience, even the most hardened atheist will cry out, God help me! <laughs> yeah. And that the whole purpose of it is for the hallowing of His name, to the purpose of worshipping His glorious pre-existence, pre-existent lovely, loving sovereignty. For God so loved the world. So, where am I going? This is actually about spiritual gifts. This is exactly the point. Spiritual gifts. As we look in this text that we looked at today in um, Romans chapter 1, 11 and 12, we read, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Now, this, is, this, this text is a little bit misleading here because it has the sense of Paul wanting them to have a gift. I, I long to see you that I may, may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. But that's not what it's saying. What the Bible is saying is that Paul wants to impart his gift or gifts to the church in Rome in order, in order to strengthen them. And then he qualifies this, and then he says, in fact, it's another aspect, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So the first thing we see here in the context of spiritual gifts is that spiritual gifts are given for the strengthening of others. I want to give you my gift that I might strengthen you. That you might, your faith might be stronger. That you can grow in your, in your sense. In your, and by, please, Lord, as, I, as I'm preaching this, may this be a reality. That the gift that you give me here today does exactly that and lifts somebody's heart up to a stronger faith in you. See, that's a spiritual gift. And its spiritual gifts are spiritually given. It's got nothing to do with Doug and it's got nothing to do with Paul. We will see that because it is a Holy Spirit given gift. Just going to, just like God's just putting in this on my heart right now. This last weekend I married my daughter and uh, for the second time. So I've said no third time. <laughs> And uh, Lisa got married in Tauranga. Those of you know Lisa. But what a joy. What a joy. It really was. And um, there I had this audience. Half of, the, half of Scotland descended. The, the Hamilton family flew over from Scotland. And then it was all their connections. And I had just the most amazing audience at, at the wedding. And I said to Lisa, first and foremost, I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm going to marry you, but, you know. I'm... And it was Easter. Now, as I sit here today, I know that there will be mixed thoughts about Easter, and everybody will have an opinion. Well, praise God for that. Always just remember, express your opinion in the context of love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. But anyway, I had this moment where, and, and really the theme that I took in my little talk at the wedding was, you know, Easter being a time of the unexpected. And I said, you know, the world stops at this moment and it looks to what Easter was about. And whether we're not looking at its pagan origins and going into all of that, that hassle, but the essence of Easter is the death of Jesus. And I said, on that day, there was a, a mum who saw a son being tortured to death on a cross. And he was surrounded by his friends who their aspirations and their, the, everything about them in their sense of their future together was shattered in that moment as they watched their Lord, their, their Lord and Savior being crucified. And then I took that in the context. I said, but you know, this is, the, this is Easter Sabbath, but the day that lay ahead was... Sunday, the day in which God was going to raise Jesus from the dead. And then I just brought that into the context of the great plan of salvation that God has always had from the moment of, e of, of, the, of the fall in Eden. God has got a plan for this world and it is being fulfilled. And if you love the Lord, his plan is for you. 
And then I carried on with the wedding sermon. You know, praise the Lord. And it had nothing to do with me. Again, I always believe that, you know, like when they were moving the ark, never touch the glory. Do not touch the glory. Um, but the people who came up to me, and one young man came to me and said, you know, I'm not a believer, but something when you were talking spoke into my heart there, and it really touched me. And um, I said to him, so who do you think, why do you think it's touching you like, like, you, like it is? I said, if, you, if, if, if you're listening to that and it's resonating with you, then you're a believer. And I honestly believe that yet that young man's journey into the kingdom has now begun. Why? Because a gift, a spiritual gift was used. I love the Lord my God with all my heart and soul. And I love my neighbor as myself. And I was able to share in that moment. And God was able to anoint those words. And, and that's where the real gifting is an anointing. It is an empowering of God himself in what is happening. And so God took that. And how do I know that? Because I know it by the result. The strengthening of faith that took place in another heart. And this is exactly what Paul is talking about. I resonate with that. I understand it. He said, when your gift is used for, and this is the main point of spiritual gifts, and why we must not get hung up on exactly what your spiritual gift is. Anything that God anoints in the occupation and the activity of your life to bring and to strengthen the faith of another person is a spiritual gift. It is the grace of God flowing through you into the life and the soul of another human being. And that is the point of church. Spiritual gifts are for the strengthening of others. They are gifts are given to be given. Spiritual gifts, just to walk around and say, I have the gift of prophecy and never prophesy, that's useless. Um, you, you need to have the gift and you need to use the gift. So the, the, the gifting is really by the grace of God, as we will see. It is truly just it is the grace of God flowing through you to somebody else. And when that flows through you, you are, and we will see that, um, when you give to somebody else, something flows back to you. Something flows back to you. Uh, spiritual gifts, the Bible actually says elsewhere in... Uh, 1 Thessalonians um, chapter 3, verse 2. It says, We send Timothy, our brother and servant, in the gospel of Christ to strengthen you in your faith. Same word as is used in, in, in Romans chapter 1, 12, 11. Uh, to strengthen you in your faith and to exhort you that no one be moved by these afflictions. So to strengthen someone by spiritual gift means to help their faith not give way as easily when troubles enter their life. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, as I was kind of processing this again last night, and uh, you know, I'm always believe I love that concept of grow. What are your goals? What's the reality? What are the opportunities? What next? Just, uh, just uh, yeah, so it's a, mnem uh, it's a mnemonic for remembering. So it's goals. So, but what is the reality of church in terms of spiritual gifting? If spiritual gifts are given for the upliftment of people's faith, particularly when somebody's having a hard time, what happens? Did you see how that so-and-so's daughter came dressed to church? Man, she's got one foot out in the world, that girl. Or, you know, I, I hear that person's leading a, 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 a different life. You know, the, the talk goes and the, the, the uh, criticism starts to flow. And how many people go and talk to the girl? How are you doing? Everything okay? You know, Jesus loves you. We love you. We love you so much. Um, 
See, the human condition is one of criticism, and it's one of, um, you know, judgmentalism. It's one of looking at everybody else through the context and the prism of my likes and dislikes. Um, and yet we are the church of Christ and the church of spiritual gifting that we faith should flow and uh, faith should be built up. And yeah, you know, it's easy to preach these things when I know in my own heart how judgmental I've been and how I have uh, hurt people in their walk, in their spiritual walk, by maintaining and looking to protect the boundaries and to expect um, certain behaviors. Um, and, and when the whole point of spiritual gifts is for the upliftment and the building of people, of people's faith, but particularly, particularly people who are fragile or going through a hard, hard time. I don't know your church, but you know what? I always say, this is my experience, just scratch a little bit in a family underneath the surface. Just scratch a little bit. There's not a family in this church who's not affected in some way, who's not having some struggle of some form that is just a... So, but the problem is, what do we do? We all come to church, we put on our, you know, our, our brighter smile, and, uh, you know, and so we, we become this place of where, you know, we all, so we, we become stuck fast in, in our boundaries and the style of operating um, to the detriment sometimes when somebody's heart is really, really struggling and they've got such an issue. So, the point is that as yours, for your spiritual gift, use it. Um, the point is actually not really knowing your spiritual gift as much as it is desiring to use your gift for the strengthening of others. Now, if you just think, coming back to where we started, that... Um, you know, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Love, love God. Enjoy in God. Delight in God. And then love your neighbor as yourself. You know, our prayer every morning should be, God, you're just the most amazing God. You know, let me walk in this joy this day. May, may you be my greatest happiness. And no matter how dark the world Lord, we, I praise you for the, for, for the sunshine of your love into my life. Now, God, please help me this day to strengthen somebody in their walk. Use me this day to bring the light of your, of, of your grace into somebody's life. What a difference. But it's starting, it's priming your mind. And then instead of walking around like sour lemons all day with a... <laughs> That we, we can walk around joyfully looking for an opportunity to strengthen somebody in their faith. As I look at my church in North Harbour, as I look at, your, as, at Whangare here today, here is a church that God wants to grow into a mighty body. I honestly believe that your kingdom come, your will be done in Whangare just as you would have it in heaven just as you would heaven. And I know that your will is for the transformation of this society and this community, that they may know the living God, they may have a sense of the kingdom of heaven, that they may know that it's not just the secular kiwiness uh, that, 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 that permeates society, but that there is a God and that they can know that, they can know the difference. As I say, reality the census always tells us otherwise. But I look forward, but I have no doubt that the kingdom of God will prevail. And why will it prevail? God's chosen instrument. And by the way, folks, it's not just Whangarei Seventh day Adventist Church, it's all of God's church in the whole of Whangarei. Every child of God that is here, I always say, and uh, you know, you're welcome to shoot me down afterwards if you like. That's good, I've got to be roared back. But I always say the seventh day event is a walk of discipleship. If you want to, this is this is about growing. We're all in a process of 
growing. And we have this beautiful teaching in the sense of the fullness of discipleship. But not everybody who is not in this fullness is lost to, this, to, to the cause of God, or lost to the kingdom. Let us never, ever forget that. I have seen it. I've seen the power of God at work through the wider, broader uh, context of his kingdom. And his kingdom will prevail. And people will come to that point. I have no question that when Jesus comes, you know, the whole world, you know, the, the, the latter rain is poured out, there will be a clear division and everybody, the kingdom will be united and, um, and, and we will all walk together in that discipleship, in that loyalty to God, with God supreme in our lives. But until that day, we, 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 we pray for the, for the utilization of the full body of Christ to bring a sense of the kingdom of heaven into this world in which we live. So, coming back to spiritual gifts. What are your spiritual gifts? It's not so much about naming your gifts, but really, are we doing what we can to strengthen the faith of the people around us? I think the biggest problem we have is not desiring very much to strengthen other people's faith. As I said, I think human nature is more prone to tearing down than to building up. But anyway, <laughs> I'm not going to go down that dark road. That's for Douglas and his dark waters. I'm going to go down the, the stream of light. <laughs> but I do know that I think this is just really about um, an awareness and a wake-up call. And I always say when I preach, I preach to myself. You know, how many people did I encourage this week? How many people... And you know, often the people who are struggling the most are the most unlikable <laughs> at that moment in time. They're probably the people you least want to be speaking to. And uh, so, yeah. But I want to become that kind of person. I want to continue to grow into that kind of person. Lord, oh, how I want to strengthen people's faith today. Grant that at the end of this day, somebody will be more confident of your promises and more joyful in your grace because I crossed their path. That should be my prayer every single morning. And you know, I really believe fervently that if that is the cry of your heart, God will never let you down. The Holy Spirit will always give you that opportunity. Always. In order to, so that your longing does not go to waste. When we encourage others, I love what Paul says here. He says in verse 12, I want to strengthen you, verse 11, he says, I want to strengthen you with my spiritual gift. That is, I want us to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And I think this is the second great, if you want to grow your faith, if you want to walk closer to God, Use your gift for the upliftment of somebody else. Because you know what happens? When you use your gift, something comes back to you. I always say it's like prayer. You know, you know what is so beautiful about prayer? Um, when, when you go into prayer, and I mean real you know, vertical, horizontal prayer, in other words, vertically, you reach up to God, and you, 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 you fix your mind on God so there's no distractions. And, and, then you, and then you become the medium as you pray for somebody. And you're, bringing, you're praying to God in faith for the, a blessing in somebody else. Somebody else's life. Or in, for some situation. Or some sickness or whatever. And it's a prayer of faith. It's the same principle that applies in the use of spiritual gifts. When you come out of prayer, how do you feel? Do you feel drained? Do you feel tired? I don't know about you, but you know, God just wakes me up in the middle of the night sometimes, and then I will just spend time praying, and you know, people will come to mind, and I'll pray for them. I don't know why I'm praying for them, but I'm praying for them, and then I'm not tired that day. I never am. It's like a song in my heart as I go about my day. Why? Because the strength and the joy of the Lord, in a, in a sense, it's like touching the divine. 
It's like entering into that, into that, in, 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 in the closeness of the intimacy of God. And in His presence is joy and strength and beauty. And that's where that joy is. And, and, and in that, you walk, it's exactly the same with spiritual gifts. Paul's, where Paul says that we may be mutually that we may be mutually strengthened. That's exactly what he's saying. He says here, um, to, uh, just bring this. That he, he's saying that when I'm strengthening you with my gift, my faith is encouraged in the process. So, verse 11, so he aims to strengthen them in verse 12. It's, it's encouragement that works both ways. You know, when you've been in the joy of the Lord, and whenever you step into service, by the way, always, there's a, there's a sense and a presence of anointing that goes with it. Whether you're teaching children, and you're doing so in the Lord, or whether you are you just, you, you're with your workmates, or whatever you're doing it, you're doing it in a, in a personal, intimate relationship with God. There's an anointing presence that pervades that when it's a moment. I always, um, even going into the, into the back room, Lou, late. <laughs> but you know, when you were praying, it's just, just um, there was a sense of God's presence in the back there. There's an anointing. And I, and, and I always, for me, that's always an affirmation. Doug, you're in the right place at the right time for the right reason. And it's, uh, and, and it's going forward in that expectation. Be honest, whenever I'm going somewhere to preach, and I'm never confident and you know what? That's a good thing. Never be confident. Never think, oh, you know, I know this message and I'm going to rattle that off. No. This here at the moment that we are in is a, it, 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 is a God moment. This is a, a church body of Christ moment. This is the only moment we have right now. We are in it together. We are in the presence of God and the Spirit of God is moving in the upliftment and the, and, and the growth of faith and the challenging of our thoughts. Um, that's an amazing, amazing place to be because so few people in this world actually get to know that. That is the joy of being in church. Let us appreciate it. Let us embrace it. And let us, let, let, let us make it the most precious thing that we have. That anointing is the affirmation of the presence of God. When you do help somebody, and you do, there's no question, if you're a Christian, you, God has used you. And in the moment of using you, you have known and you've walked away from that knowing that um, the Spirit of God has taken control of a moment of your life for the greater glory of God and for His kingdom. And there's nothing more beautiful than that. And it encourages you and it builds you up. But the point I want to make here, it does not belong to you. It does not belong to me. It's by the grace of God. It is purely by the grace of God. Romans 12 verses 3 to, 3 to 8 says, By the grace given me, I bid everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And when he's saying this, by the grace given to me, you know that he knows now he's talking in his gifting in bringing um, wisdom into the life of the Roman church. He says, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned him. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who contributes in his liberality, he who gives aid with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. I'm going to finish with this thought. That you will have 
a moment, there's something special that God has given you for the upliftment and development of somebody else's faith. It is clearly a dominant aspect of your intimacy and your walk with God. By His grace, He has given you this gift. But don't just sit and wait in that one compartment and miss the train altogether. You, the point is that you, God will use anything that is uplifting the faith of somebody is, uh, that, that, that grows their faith, is, and in which that is anointed, an anointed moment by the Holy Spirit, is a spiritual gift. Somebody might be in church for the first time, and you see their loneliness, and you go and invite them, say, would you like to come home for lunch? And they come home for lunch, and you eat together, and it is a wonderful, joyous Christian experience that happens. And they go away after that, and the gifting of hospitality that is exercised, in which the Holy Spirit has used to grow somebody's faith and say, yes, God, there was, and they, the, there was a God moment. It might be somebody who's just really going through a hard time. And you can go to that person and say, let's go sit down and have a talk. And as they're sharing, you can say, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. That's a gift of empathy. And so the gifts, the gifts of the, the various gifts that are there in, in, in the in that, that are listed in the New Testament. That it's not categorical. It's not saying this is where I must operate. You operate in the moment and in the gifting of the Holy Spirit. The whole point is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, and with all your soul. And then let it be your desire. Lord, give me the opportunity to share and to, and, and, and to encourage somebody else in their faith, or maybe plant the seed of faith in somebody's life. And in the course of your Christian walk, you will find a recurring experience where you feel that God has used you in that moment. That then becomes your sense of your dominant your gifting, the, the, the dominant or the, the primary place where the Holy Spirit will want to, you, will, will work through you in an anointed way that the grace of God flows through you to somebody else. May God's grace abound to you more and more. May Whangarei Church, and I'm prophesying in the New Testament sense, um, may Whangarei Church be a church filled with the grace of God. Filled with the grace of God through which the Holy Spirit's gifting flows through the uplifting of the faith of each other in this church community. And flows to the uplifting of, the, of faith in the kingdom of God in the wider community. And may His kingdom come. May His will be done right here in Whangarei just as He would have it in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.